really clear when we go up for public notification that we were, we were removing the public's right to be notified because I think this is really at the heart of the debate we, we will have with government that they want us to have less notification, uh, less times people need consents and actually the community, I, I know from being a, you know, in, in, in my ward at least, yeah. actually many of the contentious consents go through non-notified and they would say where, where you get a big orange building appearing in a wetlands, adjacent to a wetlands, that, that should be notified. So I, I just think we need to, you know, I, I personally feel a little bit concerned that you're removing some of the rights for people to be involved, um, but I know that government are putting that pressure on and I know that the changes they're making to the RMA have, have meant that it's harder for us to notify. But I do think, uh, you know, I do, I do worry that we'll end up with a situation where local communities are totally alienated from major developments and having any input. Um, it is very clearly identified in every chapter under every activity whether it's notified or not. The exception where it's not to be notified is what is written under the activities where it applies. And, and of course that's just for um, restricted discretionary and discretionary activities. So the fact that um, this is any activity listed in Rule 15.42.1. Sorry, what page are you? 76. So, so you've given Belfast the commercial, which I guess is a new shopping mall, isn't it? Uh, a new um, parade of shops. So it would be a local centre um, intended to only serve that new subdivision. But so it's a new, but it's a new mall, isn't it? It's the, no, no, no. It's not the big mall development. No, no, no it's no. a different one. It's a different one. This is, um, this is a greenfield residential area, so a future right. housing subdivision, and within that, a new commercial centre proposed. So, um, A local centre. A local centre. So it's um, the parade of shops that residents can walk to for so a what, So basically the effect of this role is saying if they, go, if they build buildings more than 100 metres square, there'll be no notification to the community. If they propose a building of more than 100 square metres, it's subject to resource consent to assess design, but won't be notified to the community. Mm. So you could get like a big Bunnings or a warehouse? The, the rules would preclude that. So for a commercial local centre, it's envisaged to be small scale shops, a dairy, a coffee shop, and so the height, the height limits and the activity list preclude those activities from... Uh, a large Bunnings from going in there, for instance. So what would be the worst case scenario for what could go there that the community might be really concerned with that they would have no say on? Oh, I'd say that the, um, what are those shops called? Um, no, the legal highs. <laughs> but they, in terms of anywhere. scale, like I'm just trying to understand, you know, because if this makes a lot of sense, I'm, you know, I'm relaxed, but if this means that people don't have a right to have a say on things that drastically change what's expected um, that, you know, removes, I don't know, covers them in shade or whatever, no. Um, no. then I'd be concerned. No, no. if um, what this is about, this particular one, this, first of all we need to look at the wording and it's about a local centre. So there are standards for height and um, bulk and various other standards. This this lack of notification or this... this um, phrase here relates to only this one particular activity which is about urban design for buildings over 100 square metres that there won't be any notification of that specific activity. That, but it still will be a consent. That's right. Is that correct? That's right. And, um, and notified. Yes. And, the, and there's a whole range of standards that, if breached, would trigger a resource consent mm. for other reasons, which... Uh, and this, this, this clause has only concern with design. Mm. So if there's a breach of the height standard or a breach of the recession plane, which uh, protects sunlight to adjoining properties, that will be subject to a separate rule which will trigger a res resource consent but not preclude notification of that. Mm. That's why it's very specific under each activity where um, notification will not be required. The, the matters of discretion are just urban design or? That's right. So that's 15.8.1. Unfortunately, um, you won't have the whole chapter, so um, that's... 
may not be in the package you've got. Yeah, what we've given you today is just the revisions that we've made. Yeah, no, I think it, it is, 15 point. Oh, okay. So, that's things like, well, I don't, um, general matters 15.8.1, does that include all the sub-clauses in that chapter? It, would 15.8.1.4 be included in those general matters of discretion? Uh, the general matters of discretion cover a whole range of design matters about how a development fits into its context, how it relates to the immediately surrounding properties, um, covers even green buildings and the degree to which there's environmentally sustainable design. Not but 15.8.1.4 um, is, is only one part of that but, order. But it, but it is effectively something that would come under that general matter of discretion. So access parking and servicing, that would be an area that you remove... Um, uh, you basically remove the notification. Is that how I'd read this? Or am I just reading it completely wrong? Um, this, is, this is about the visual impacts of car parking, for instance, and the transport chapter still has triggers for any retail activity over 250 square metres, which um, effectively means that traffic effects of, the, of a, re, a, a retail use over 250 square metres is still considered separately. You, um, something to bear in mind is this is one of a number of rules that needs to be complied with and any other rule that's not complied with potentially w will warrant notification of that application. So if, for instance, it triggers the uh, rule for an uh, integrated transport assessment, then it could well be the case that it's considered based on that non-compliance that it should be notified, but in respect of this non-compliance, it's limited to design and, and the visual aspects of development. So, hence, um, in respect to that clause about car parking, it's it's about the visual effects of car parking, amongst other matters, right. and um, its design. So, there's a wider assessment that's considered through the transport chapter, looking at the traffic effects of development. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um. Uh, the next was um, effects of on what I call community infrastructure of large developments. And um, in this context, um, it's, it's public transport, it's open space, as well as um, community facilities and the impacts of these larger developments in our commercial centres on, the, on that infrastructure. And if I can turn to page 1616 to begin with. At the bottom of page 16, there's a, a new rule introduced, and this is just in the context of the commercial core zone, but it also applies in the commercial fringe zone. Um, any building extension to a building or redevelopment involving more than 4,000 square metres of gross leasable floor area uh, requires consent, and an assessment is required of the effects that development has on community infrastructure. Now, um, the trigger of 4,000 is based on a trigger in the current city plan, which relates to the layout um, of a development and uh, a range of matters in terms of the impacts that development has. Now, if I can turn to page 125, 125. On that page, you'll find at the top, at the top of 125 in orange text is the matters that will be assessed when an application comes forward based on that non-compliance with that rule. So any development over 4,000 square metres, whether it's an addition or a or new building, uh, would need to consider and demonstrate um, whether the extent to which the development will have adverse effects on community infrastructure. And community infrastructure is defined under the Local Government Act and is defined um, as stated here, it um, includes but not limited to community facilities, open space and public transport, and um, the effects on its use, availability, quality of offer, but also whether the development provides for infrastructure to meet existing and future demand, having regard to a range of matters there. So um, we've, we've um, proposed this approach that triggers the need for resource consent to enable us to assess the effects of each individual each development over 4,000 4, square metres and consider, consider these matters, rather than an approach of putting standards in the plan which would require, let's say, uh, for a 4,000 square metre development, we require 1,000 square metres of public space. The difficulty of that approach is we, we don't have an understanding of how much space is required or 
how it relates to other spaces within that centre. So from, from a planning perspective, it's, um, it leaves us greater scope to be able to assess the effects and what provisions made uh, on a case-by-case -case basis rather than applying a standard which not, doesn't necessarily fit with all scales, all sizes and shapes of development. But I'd welcome feedback on that. Yanni? Would, would you require an outline development plan? Like, is that one way that you could get some certainty? Because I do think there's a need for certainty. Like, um, because what will happen is they'll apply for a resource consent and they'll say, well, there's a few bus stops up the road, um, like, like Rickerton, for example. Oh, you've already got a, a, a bus stop on the main road, so we don't need to provide for it. And they'll probably get a resource consent because most get, you know, non notified, non compliant get granted. So I, I just kind of don't want, you know, ways for them to get out of this requirement. So how can we be more explicit that it is actually a requirement that a set amount of something comes back because there's a real need? Well, that is what any rule in the district plan has to deal with uh, in effect. So if there is an effect, then yes, then, then we can trigger this rule to, to determine what that is and what is required. But if, for example, there are, pub, there are um, bus stops on that road with an easy walkable vicinity and it's decided that this is not creating a, an additional effect, then, then that would um, suffice. It doesn't because you don't get that integrated land use plan that, that makes sense or has comprehension. What you get is an ever-increasing retail strip that, that, that just basically turns its back to things that people need to service it. But so that's what I've said, it has to be based on an effect. If there is increasing need and the effect is that, the, that one bus stop is not sufficient, then yes, another bus stop might be required or, or whatever it is that it's being assessed for. Um, community facilities, open space, or public transport. So, so like the idea that we have overseas, like you go to Malaysia or Thailand and you go, you, you take the bus and you end up under the mall, you just go up an elevator and you're in a mall. It'd be really interesting to know, like what planning things do they put in place to ensure that you get that integrated development? Because, it's, you know, I can just see, you know, basically, um, if we just leave it to the developer, they'll hire expensive lawyers, expensive experts, they'll argue, you know, to their blue in the face that they don't need to do it because there's a library across the road, even though there's you know, five major lanes of traffic going through, um, so there's no requirement and they get around it. Mm. Uh, I, don't, I don't want them getting around it. I, the, I think the thing is that though we have to work within the Resource Management Act, and while there might be other um, mechanisms or methods that are able to be used, it will depend on what mechanisms they used overseas. They don't have the Resource Management Act. All of our decisions have to be effects-based. Um, and, and so that's what I'm telling you. If there is shown to be a need that creates an adverse effect, then we can bring this rule into play and perhaps require them to have, uh, you know, uh, contribute towards further community facilities, open space or public transport. But if it can be shown that, that, that there isn't the need for it, then, then no. Well, hang on, I, I think that, but this is the debate that we had mm. around, you know, what's happened at Rickerton. You know, the, the ever-increasing expansion of, um, of that mall, mm -hmm. the, the, the huge clustering of people in that environment on a daily basis, the large number of people who use public transport to get there, and they, 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 they really stand in the way of our capacity to deliver truly effective, um, direct um, access to their mall um, from, from, the bus, um, inter from a bus interchange. You know, it's just, you know, if anyone had designed an ideal outcome from the outset, when the, when the mall was originally um, being expanded towards Rickerton Road, they would have said, you've got to have a direct entry mm -hmm. on Rickerton Road mm -hmm. through a bus exchange. You know, it would have been obvious, but the rules aren't obvious. And I mean, you've come back and you've said it's got to be effects-based yeah. under the Resource Management Act. But how the hell isn't that an effect? It is an, eff it is an effect. Uh, um, as I've said before, though, these rules cannot be retrospective. As you rightly say, if the mall had have been developed perhaps now under these new rules, yes, we have various opportunities, including the urban design rules, to, to require that to happen. 
but Rickerton Mall is in place. Um, so far it hasn't come in for yet another consent for increase in size. If it does before these rules are um, made operative, then we only have the existing rules to go by. Would you like to... Ma Ma Madam Mayor, my, my, recollection of the, my recollection of the discussion at the last workshop was that um, you suggested there should be consideration of an option of a rule that says once a mall gets to a particular size or goes above a particular size, there's a requirement for an outline development plan before consenting any further development. And that as part of that outline development plan requirement, um, the applicant would have to show how things like public transport are going to be integrated with the development. Mm. I don't think I use the words outline development plan because no, I haven't no, been here that Some long. kind of master yeah. plan. <laughs> master yeah. plan. So, so, so that, that was raised as, as an option that had would, would quite properly be considered by the council in deciding what are the most appropriate provisions in the plan, which is exactly what we're doing now. Mm. Ha, has that been further considered for the purposes of, of this chapter? I don't know. Uh, certainly. Um, this, this, what I've put forward is one an option, obviously, we, we can add to it by requiring an outline development plan if, if development master exceeds, plan. or a master plan if development exceeds a certain threshold, and or if there's development of a large scale, uh, such as over 4,000 square metres. So I'm open to um, adding that to this. Like, so if you think about it, say you get 4,000 square metres, and you go, right, so if you want to have a big mall, and you know, you've you now have a requirement, if you want to go to 5,000 square metres, that 10% of that space will be vested. A bit like the reserves stuff that we do, you know, where they give a contribution and it goes into addressing the issue. So it might be a percentage of the land area, that would be my preference, that goes back into public ownership for the provision of community infrastructure. I mean, that's basically what, what, what I'm arguing. Mm. 